welcome to episode three of the Pi Podcast, the show by members of the Raspberry Pi community for the Raspberry Pi community. I'm Joe. I'm Isaac. And I'm Albert. And coming up, we'll be talking to Kat Lamin about sharing Pi knowledge with teachers at her coding evenings. But before that, there's been quite a lot of news happening. So uh, let's get on with that. The big news this week or in the last week has been the uh, Raspberry Pi display has been released. So uh, the Raspberry Pis, they've since the beginning, have had a little connector on them, a DSi connector for display. And we've even seen previews of it. Well, it was released during the week at about £48 in the UK. And you're lucky enough to have one in your house, aren't you, Albert? I do indeed. I ordered one uh, the day it came out from the lovely guys at Pimeroni with their uh, acrylic stand. Um, yeah, and I got a chance to set it up and have a play with it. It's very nice. It is a very nice display. It's hefty. It's heavier than I expected. It's, it's very sturdy. I can see that it's made so that uh, kids can knock it about a bit. Um, the electronics are visible at the back, but from the front, it is a, it is a very solid piece of, uh, of equipment. So what OS are you playing with, Albert? Uh, just the Raspbian default. So you need to do uh, an update on Raspbian. And then the display is uh, enabled as standard. So literally just did a apt get update, apt get upgrade, plugged everything in, and the display came on straight away with the full multi-touch enabled as well. So it's a uh, resolution is, I think it's 800 by 480, which is low, not HD. But it's definitely good enough to be used. Um, it's very, very crisp and very clear. So, it, you know, it's digital all the way, which is fantastic. And uh, it just plugs in and it works. And the great thing is you can also run HDMI in parallel with it. So you're still free to use the HDMI port for a second display. So I'm looking forward to seeing things like um, the Kodi and the Open Source Media Center use the display as as the controller with the video being played on the separate HDMI display. So I think we'll see some really innovative things being done there. And then for a nice compact system, um, it's a nice little size. So it's a nice companion screen as well to go next to uh, any other equipment that you have that you're working on. In terms of powering it, then, it, you can run both the Pi and the screen from one power supply, can't you? Yeah, you can plug your power into the... Uh, the board that comes with the screen, and then you can use jumper leads to jumper it from the five volts uh, to the Pi itself. You definitely need a good power supply um, on booting up. On the Raspberry Pi, if, if you've got low power, a little rainbow square appears in the top right-hand corner. Um, and I had a situation where with one of my power supplies, that square appeared. Once it had started up and it was running, it disappeared. So there was no problems actually running it. But to begin with, it definitely uh, was kind of saying that it had problems and concerns about the power, but very quickly went away when I was actually using it. So when they say you need a reliable and a, a good quality power supply, they mean it. And two amps minimum, I would expect, is what you're going to need to have. So the update for Raspbian just allows it to be touchscreen, correct? There's nothing extra added on to it. Is that right? I think it includes the the drivers that are needed to run the display. So the display is a DSI connector. So it's a completely different protocol, completely different system. Okay, so I might be asking something you're not, you haven't had a chance to play with. So is it as smooth as playing with, say, a normal tablet with like an iPad or any Android tablet? Is it like that smooth or is it a little bit more Raspbian, the OS I have on my Pi, but just touchscreen capabilities? It's touch-based Raspbian, so it doesn't change the OS. So it's got touchscreen, and you can get a touchscreen keyboard to put on it, so you can have a tablet-type experience. Um, I haven't done that yet. I've literally used it as a, as a display. So I've run Minecraft on it to see what that worked like. It was great. It worked. You know, it, it it's really good. I can see, for me personally, I can see it being more a text display. So if we're doing things in the terminal, more so than the graphics, um, I could see a situation where many of the applications, their menus, you know, once the icons and the ribbons and the bars all start appearing, that you could lose that vertical space very quickly. But it worked great. Scratch worked on it. Um, the areas to work in were obviously smaller, but it absolutely functions. It, it, it's great once you're running the programs themselves. Um, for coding, it does mean a bit more scrolling is needed as you'd expect from that resolution display. And in terms of the touch then, uh, you said you didn't get much chance to play with it, but does it feel responsive? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, as I said, I just use it as a, a you know, a mouse type thing. I didn't check out the uh, the 10 point multi touch, but yeah, it's absolutely fine. Works great. And the demo that they showed of it with the uh, the demo application, you know, moving the pictures around and scaling. I mean, that looks fantastic. I definitely want to get that on the, uh, the Raspberry Pi to have a look at it and see what it's really capable of. Yeah, we'll post that in the show notes. Uh, it looks like there was a tutorial by Matt Richardson using Kivi, I believe, to really enhance the touchscreen capabilities along with, uh, I think, some wiring he had done on a breadboard. So that looked really cool. Yeah, that looks great. And, and again, Kivi, I've kind of had a, a quick look at it just to see what it's about. And uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping it's not beyond my ability. No, it's a, it looks like it's an open source Python framework. So it's on yep. GitHub. You can pull it down. I think it'd be pretty easy to handle. And we also have a, in the show notes how to make a 3D printed display stand for it. Yeah, I think that's the, the Raspberry Pi guy's uh, 3D model, which is uh, nice and snazzy. And as I said, I went for the, uh, the Pimeroni stand. Uh, which again, it's their, their usual acrylic pieces. I have a couple of their um, flotilla cases for Pi, so I went for the flotilla color again. And uh, yeah, it's very nice. Works works really well. It holds it up. It's it's sturdy. And, and not a bad price for something that you can guarantee will work 100%. Because you can get these cheap Chinese ones, and you, then you have to kind of hack kernel modules and stuff. Whereas to just know you, you keep it up to date, your Raspbian installation and then this is just going to work perfectly. So, uh, yeah, it's very attractive. I would love to get one, but I think I'd just get shouted at by my wife for cluttering up the place. So I'm going to have to, have to play with yours instead, I think. Oh, but, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have a play with it at the next jam Yeah, coming up and uh, hopefully uh, convince my wife to let me get one. <laughs> so this, this uh, touchscreen has been a long time in the making, I believe. Does this live up to the hype so far? For the weight, I mean? I think it's great. As I said, I, I, I set it up and had a play with it. I think for me personally, it'll be more text-based. It'll encourage me to do more Python rather than just messing about in the GUI. So, um, but it is crystal clear. It is really, really sharp and it, it just works. And as I said, leaving the HDMI free means that some of those projects that require a, a control panel and a separate display will be so much easier to do. So looking forward to that. I, you know, I've seen people hacking it with the, the GPIO connected screens. Um, I know Adafruit have one that you can get that, uh, again, kind of goes through the GPIO, doesn't require this, or there's the VGA666 board that Geert, and I can't remember his surname, designed, and that, again, just basically bit bashes 6-bit VGA out through the GPIO using a whole bunch of resistors. I, I, I went for the Kickstarter on that, but I've never built it. And this, I got it, and I had it set up, you know, fairly quickly i was actually working at home so i and i got it delivered to the office so i had to run into the office to get it secretly without letting anybody know i was there <laughs> it's a bit fiddly to connect the cables so i think they're making a good decision uh they're saying that in the future it'll come pre-built pre-made because there's a little daughter board uh, with the controller on it that you need to connect up and that is a little bit fiddly to do we'll link to alex Eames again has got another fantastic video he's two videos one on the display itself and then one on building it and how to put it together and it's definitely worthwhile watching his because I was kind of looking at it because the version I got, I'd expect because it's one of the first batch, didn't have any instructions with it. So Alex's video really showed how easy it was to put together once you kind of know where the bits go, basically. Yeah, well, I can imagine some good implementations of Cody, like open a LEC running with that screen and you can have yourself a nice little media experience but for that you're going to need a lot of storage so that's where the new western digital kit comes in where you can have a one terabyte drive and a power supply and a four gig sd card for running the um the os and cables and stuff all for 45 pounds yeah that's with the uh, the promotion code that's there at the moment so they say it's limited availability but I, again i it doesn't say what the limitation is so there's a code for the uk and there's a code for the us and it's 45 pounds in the uk is what the promotion code gives you and the, the, the great thing with this is it's one power supply. Again, one power supply, power the Pi, power the drive at the same time. The four gig card is just about enough to hold Raspbian. But actually, more importantly, you can put the boot partition on the SD card and then put your main operating system on the drive. Because if you're using this, you're always going to have the hard drive plugged in. And that makes a, a real boost to the performance. It's It's something that I've considered doing for a while but i haven't put it together yet is just use an external drive for the main operating system uh storage and it, it's supposed to give a good old boost even through the usb ports 
Yeah, I don't I don't know about you guys, but I like the touch screen that's really cool, but this is what I'm way more amped up on because I've ran into this issue already with my Raspberry Pi because I have an external drive, but it's USB powered and my Pi cannot power it as well. Yep, yeah, I've had that problem. Yeah, and unless you have a powered hub and then it's just more cables. So. Exactly. And and it's hard to find a cheap uh, external hard drive that has its own power supply. And I've also ran into issues. I'm already currently running into issues now where my SD card can't take the, you know, it's, it's already reaching limitations of the space. And I've been hunting for an easier, more cost effective solution to getting more space. And this is right up my alley. Another thing I love about this is that it comes with no case. So just like the Pi is kind of bare bones and a circuit board in your hands, yeah. so is this hard drive. So I love that idea to be able to just hook it at will. I'm definitely going to buy this i'm already probably gonna buy this i probably won't get done doing this podcast i was looking at buying it last night i just kind of held off but i I want this way more than i want the touch screen because currently like i said i'm having problems i'm trying to set up every project i've done with the pi has resulted in space issues immediately with i did my security cam idea i had to route all the i had to use some some magic basically through the cloud to route everything to another external computer and now I've ran into issues using my Raspberry Pi as a dev server because already space is getting clogged up. And this is what I've been hunting for. And I'm very much amped up to try this out. On the um, Pi thing, powering things from the Raspberry Pi, the B plus and the two, um, they've got better power circuitry for the USB. So there is a setting that you can change to allow it to provide more power through the USB ports. So for most portable drives, it should be possible again if your main power supply is good enough. Um, but it's one of these things where you get to try it, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, then yeah, you got to get an external hub. So it's still not guaranteed to work with all drives, but you can now provide more power through the uh, the USB ports than before. But you have to change a line in the uh, the config.txt file to let that happen. Cool. I'll definitely uh, check that out. Because I would love to use my external drive very much so. Because I don't feel like buying another one. Because why have two external drives? It's they already have enough. I mean, more enough space than I really need. But I'm really amped up. Uh, if any of our listeners get their hands on the touch screen or this uh, Pi drive, please let us know uh, how you like it and some of the ins and outs of it. Yeah, show at the piepodcast dot com. So one that you put in, Isaac, was the Go Box, a Kickstarter from Dexter Industries. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of Dexter Industries. Um, they sponsor my meetup. And for those of you who are listening to this and they're going to be in the Washington, D.C. area on September 28th, please come to the meetup. Uh, Taryn, I believe that's how you say her name, Taryn Sullivan of Dexter Industries will be there giving a talk showcasing their Go Pi Go product. And also, I believe Matt Richardson should be stopping by just to make a guest appearance. But anyway, this Go Box kind of plays hand in hand with their Go Pi Go product, which is basically a robot they've designed to specifically go is it's just built around the raspberry pi in and of itself so you can use scratch to help develop robot functionality and using scratch and the simplicity of their go pi go concept it's really extremely kid friendly and gets kids interested in the pi and also in robotics so i'm a big fan of this kickstarter i believe it's already funded and you can just i think just keep giving you know more money to them of course and i think tie in with some of the monthly giveaways i'm not for sure i need to read more about their kickstarter here on go the go box there's quite a bit to it on the kickstarter page yeah the robot looks good and it there's again supporting the educational work there's monthly projects so you can either just go for the robot itself or you can sign up for the content only if you already got one of their robots or you can sign up for the the 12 month program with the robot as well and each month you receive additional parts that you can add to it to to improve it and do different things. So it's kind of like a, you're, you're signing up for a year's worth of activity and fun. It's pretty nice. You can't beat that, and especially the uh, product. It's hard enough to build a robot on your own with the Pi. I'm currently in the midst of trying to do that. It's a little bit more work than I anticipated. <laughs> and I think for, especially for uh, any kid, it'd be nice to just uh, get them this kit and they can easily just take off running with it. Yeah. The other thing that was, that came out last week or this week was the, um, the interview with Evan Upton by uh, the Raspberry Pi guy. So this was on Twitter saying provide questions and uh, the interview happened and it was put out there. And the the one standout thing in there for me was the commentary on uh, Wayland and where that was at, but also the camera. 
The actual sensor module in the camera, um, Eben mentioned, is going end of life, and they've done a bulk buy, which means it, it sounds like their hand is being forced to come up with a new camera, which again, I mean, I, I, I love the camera that they have at the moment. It's really easy to connect and it works really, really well. And the, the Python libraries for it make it really, really simple to do interesting things with. Um, so I'm interested in seeing what they do with the uh, the next camera module once they've burned through this lot. Yeah, I really uh, like what the Raspberry Pi guy does, and we'll put a link to the show notes for a lot of uh, for his website, which has great tutorials, videos, an awesome blog. And please check out this interview as well that Albert's talking about because it's a really good interview. And uh, leading into our interview with Kat Lamon, uh, we have a article about a uh, it's a beautiful story about a doctor. Arlaby, I believe that's how you say his name. I probably chopped that up quite a bit. But anyway, it's about him learning. He learned about the pie during some of his doctoral studies. He uh, uh, took the pie, started doing three-day workshops back where he's from, originally in India, teaching kids about Raspberry Pi. And I'll let the listeners take it from there. Please read that article. It's a great lead into our Cat Lamon interview with her Cody Evenings. And it all ties hand in hand with getting kids Raspberry Pis and teaching more people about this. Yeah, worth a read. So you mentioned it there. Let's move on to the interview. We're now joined by Kat Lamin, who is a primary school computing coordinator who organizes Raspberry Pi based coding evenings. So welcome, Kat. Hi. So the first question, as always, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what exactly coding evenings involve? As you've already said, I'm a primary school teacher. I've been teaching for 10 years now. Um, when I found out about the new coding curriculum, I got really excited and found out as much as I possibly could. I went to Raspberry Pi training and I started doing code clubs in my school. And then I realized that there was a bit of a problem in that I was the only person who was doing things near me. So I created something called Coding Evening to help support other teachers to be able to do what I'm doing. So uh, Cam, when did you first hear about the uh, Raspberry Pi? I think I heard about it through a technician at school and eventually I bought some because I'd seen a few people talk about them on Twitter. Um, I did the classic approach of buying four Raspberry Pis that then sat in a box in the classroom for about three months. And they were taken out, poked at once, and then put away again, because I didn't know what to do. And it was when I found out about Pi Academy through Twitter again, that I really became enthusiastic about using them. And what kind of things did you do at the Pi Academy? From the, the Twitter feed, it looks like uh, everybody has a great time at it. <laughs> yeah, it's two days of free training, which is really valuable because a lot of schools don't like spending money on training. And the first day you get to grips with the Pi, you're shown how to plug it in and then you're shown some of the software on it and how to use things like the GPI opens. Um, you're shown Sonic Pi, which is a fantastic piece of music software that uses Ruby to code. And then on the second day, you're invited to create a project based on what you've learned, um, either individually, in pairs or in small groups. My main takeaway from it was a big group of friends, in all honesty, and lots of people who were willing to share and help and support each other. So in terms of getting into Pi Academy, is there a selection process for that or is it free to all? So there are currently Pi Academies running roughly every month or two. Um, initially, they were all in Cambridge. They've now started running them in Birmingham and Manchester, I think it is. And they're being supported by Google when they're working outside of uh, Cambridge. And to get a place on Pi Academy, you have to write an application explaining why you deserve a place on the course, why you've been an innovative teacher, why you're a 21st century teacher, and if possible, attach a two-minute video proving that you're a 21st century teacher. Yeah, I suppose that's quite a good uh, proof that you do know what you're talking about technically. <laughs> well, I'm not very good at making videos, so I'm not sure how I got on. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> they liked you still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How have your, uh, how your coding evenings been going so far since you started them? I'm really, really proud of how well they're going. I started off with around 15 people at the first meeting and it was five of them were my friends and the rest were a few teachers and a few community members that had seen it on again on Twitter. And now we're already up to 20 to 30 people for the next two. And I've started getting more and more businesses involved so for the October one, which is a Code Week EU special, we've got people like Fuse, Cano and PyTop coming to show what they're doing in education and how they're making Raspberry Pi more accessible to teachers. I'm very lucky to be supported by people like Pimeroni 
and Fortronics, who were always keen to share their hardware with me. And it's just been really good seeing what the teachers get from the evening. So my favourite takeaway was a lady I'd never met before who was desperate to use coding resources with her um, children with learning difficulty in college. So 16 to 17 year olds. And she had so much fun at her first meeting. She found a volunteer and she's looking forward to the next one and keeps telling me how excited she is. And I think that's what it's all about. And for the uh, the sort of technical people that turn up, what kind of things have uh, have they brought along or skills or, or what do they get from it? It's really interesting seeing the range of technical people we get. Um, there's a guy who comes to my coding evenings called Mark Grossman, and he's just one of those people who wants to help. So he brings along loads of resources that he's worked with in schools. He volunteers in, I think, three or four schools. So for him, it's just the chance to help people and support people. But he's not a teacher at the end of the day, so he can't necessarily transfer his personal skills to the classroom. And then I've got a friend of mine, John, who just loves to build things with the pie. And he just wants people to see what he's doing and inspire people to do their own projects, which for teachers can be really great because they'll see what he's doing and think, OK, I'm not going to be able to build whatever he's doing but i can use some of the ideas he's got and make my own project your coding evening happens in twickenham in west london yeah uh, i think you said before and is that it then or are there other ones kind of sprouting up everywhere you know in other places so in september there'll be a second peterborough coding evening which is run by a friend of mine who's a teacher in a special educational needs school um And she has been focusing more on middle school, whereas I've been focusing on primary. There's a group hoping to start in Birmingham soon and another hoping to start in Horsham soon, as well as another group looking at Manchester. Okay. So we're slowly expanding to take over the world. (laughs) Well, uh, that'd be my my next question for you is I run a meetup for Raspberry Pi users here in Washington, D.C., and I have several teachers at this meetup. How would I get them to help participate in Coda Evenings or even start one up here? So the main principle for Coding Evening is that you need at least one teacher on board because teachers listen more to their peers. If you come in as a consultant and try and sell them something, they'll tend to t- nod off a little bit. Personally, and the, from Hannah's perspective, we've both just been enthusiastic ourselves. So I think the best way a non-teacher can get involved is to find a teacher and persuade them that it's a great idea to help you run it which is what's happening in Horsham, actually. It's a gentleman who runs a hacking event there, wants to start his own coding evening, so he's managed to get a teacher on board. Fantastic, fantastic. And have you have any of the teachers come back to you to say how they're getting ready for the next uh, term with the Raspberry Pis? Generally, most of the feedback I get is, when is the next one? Can I please come? <laughs> so it's an ongoing thing, then. It's not a case of teachers come once, learn a bit about it, and then never come again. It, the idea is for them to keep coming and learning more about it, then. Yeah, what we've found is one of the key things I find as as a teacher is you don't get the chance to play. So one of the things that's key in coding evening is that we give the teachers the opportunity to play with the Raspberry Pi or play with a Cano or play with a Sphero robot, sorry. And so quite often a teacher will play, go and buy one for their school and then bring it back the next time and say, right, now I've got this. How do I use my own one in the classroom? Um, And it's sort of that continuing development of learning through play. Have you uh, had any negative feedback about the Cody evening so far or anything you you would like to uh, improve upon? Not yet. Um, <laughs> I'd like to be able to look at sponsorship. So at the moment, people arrive and they go and buy themselves a drink and they go and buy themselves some food. And it's really informal and it's good fun. But what I'd like to move on is to be able to get people to be able to have their first drink free. Because, again, that will appeal more to teachers because a lot of them don't want to go somewhere at the end of the day. They don't want to go and do training after school they don't want to go to do training during school time either they just don't want to do training (laughs) yeah now i know you've mentioned that it happens in pubs and you know there's a couple of drinks involved but Mm. a a slight concern of mine is that that might exclude people who don't drink i mean i know there's people who don't drink for religious reasons and cultural reasons i mean has that ever come up before that people have wanted to come and didn't want to go to a pub funnily enough somebody did mention that to me at the last Pi Academy, I popped along to do a talk um, and she said it wasn't a problem for her, but what if? And what we discussed was perhaps if people were concerned, it would be a good idea to host it in a cap- coffee shop or somewhere else that's informal. Um, I think the priority is somewhere that people can relax because most training is done in school. 
or in a big conference room and you don't feel relaxed. Yeah, it's too stuffy. You kind of want more of a, a playful atmosphere rather than yeah. a, this is training kind of thing. And I'm, I mean, I'm really lucky. My venue has a function room that they let us use. So it's not immersed in alcohol. It's just that it's there if you want it. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I think that's the ideal model, really, somewhere that's going to let you use a free function room where the opportunities are there. And for you yourself, after, after Pi Academy and doing the, um, the coding evenings, how have you used the Raspberry Pi in school? At the moment, I'm still at the early stages of introducing it because I've got a lot of catching up to do in terms of the curriculum. So I'm still spending a lot of time just teaching children what coding means. Having said that, with my year four children at the end of last term, which is seven to eight-year-old children, no, I'm lying, eight to nine-year-old children, <laughs> I plugged in the Raspberry Pi for them and I gave them a Pi Stop, which is a small traffic light device, and then they had to use Scratch to light up the different lights. So I gave them the code to do the first light and they had to work out the rest and they had to work out how to loop it and then they had to develop it and turn it into traffic lights. And that was really successful. The children just so much enjoyed that physical output. And then with the older children, the year five and six children, we've been using it a lot with code club. So after school, two or three children at a time focus on it, spend their time seeing what they can make it do. So, for example, we have a unicorn hat, which makes things makes an 8 by 8 grid of RGB neopixels light up. And so one of the children sat down and coded that one to make different patterns. Um, we have the Astro Pi Sense hat, and some of the children realised that if you adjust a certain line of Python code, they can change the colour of the writing on the screen. Are you uh, finding it easy to teach teachers about Raspberry Pi? It's hard work to introduce it. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm not Carrie Ann Philbin, so I, <laughs> I'm not as good as her at things. But the key thing I've found is that giving teachers the chance to play is really valuable and it has helped them learn and has helped them want to learn more. Have you found that some of the teachers are 20th century teachers that are trying to you know, come up to speed with it? I think that's always the case. But as long as someone's trying, then they're going to make progress from what I've seen. So, I mean, we get a range of people. We get a few young teachers in their early 20s and we get teachers all the way up to their 50s and 60s who are keen to give it a go. Okay. Yeah, from the few teachers that I've sort of worked with and, and spoken to, it's just alien. Mm. It's the, you know, what the Raspberry Pi does and how it works is is just alien. Uh, and so it's, it's in itself scary because of that. mm so it sounds like the coding evenings are a great friendly way for them to to get into it, to meet with other people who are in the same situation, to talk to people who, you know, may only be, you know, one meeting ahead of them. But it means you can go, oh, I can do, okay, at the end of tonight, I should be able to do what they did last time. Yeah. And one of the things that we do at coding evening is there's no formal plan to the evening. People sort of sit in groups and move around and ask each other what they're doing. I see my role as the facilitator. So I greet everyone as they come in, find out what their goals are and try and direct them to the right person around the room that will help them and support them. So there are a lot of teachers who already know some stuff and want to extend that knowledge. And I can forward them on to Nick, who's another teacher who know, knows loads and is really keen to share that. Or a complete beginner I'd send to Mark because he's really good at dealing with complete beginners. Brilliant. So you kind of have the different levels covered and the different bases. So do you, does it look like everybody who came to the first ones are coming back to the next? We get, I would say, about half people come back to the next one. Um, the trouble with teachers is that they're always very busy. So a lot of them will sign up for the next one. But then when it comes to the night, they can't make it. And I totally understand that because I've done it before and I've been keen to do something and just been too tired at the end of the day. But generally, people do come back. Brilliant. So we were lucky to get you before uh, the school term starts again for you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Very good. So presumably you've been doing most of this in Raspbian so far. Mm -hmm. um, now that there's a Windows 10 uh, Internet of Things uh, edition for it, is that starting to creep in? Are, are people kind of more keen to use that because it's less alien than Linux, do you think? As far as I'm aware, the Raspberry Pi Foundation are encouraging people to carry on using Raspbian with their projects in schools, and I would be happy to stick with it. I'm, I've never been a big Windows fan, if I'm honest, so I'm quite happy to stick with Raspbian because I know how it works and I'm familiar with it now. 
Oh, well, that makes me happy as a Linux user. So, uh... <laughs> Excellent. So if you had a, a recommendation for a teacher who can't get to uh, one of the coding evenings, what, what would you kind of say to them? Where should they start? What should they look at? Um, first thing would be to look at my blog, where I've been trying to very carefully write up my own failures and successes in co- with coding. And I will also hopefully be publishing an iBook to, for beginners within the next couple of months. Otherwise, there are a lot of resources on the Raspberry Pi website. Places like CAS, the Computing at School site, is fantastic for getting ideas. It can be a bit overwhelming, but it is great. And yeah, just keep an eye on Twitter. There's so much going on. And you mentioned the traffic lights there. I mean, are there any other inexpensive add-ons that can aid the, the teaching of code to kids? I think my two favourite add-ons are the Pi Stop that I've already mentioned by Fortronics and the CamJam EduKit, which is a simple breadboard with all the jumper cables you need to get three LEDs up and running, a button, a buzzer, and now I think it's got a light sensor as well. And that's, I think, f- five or seven pounds. Yeah, there's, there's two kits. The, the mm. first one is the LEDs and the buzzers, and I think that one's five pounds. And the second kit is the one with the sensors in it. Mm. I, I think that's seven. And that's brilliant because it comes with resources as well. From the website, you can download some step-by-step guides to how to get the thing up and running using python on the uh, the cas website i haven't i haven't registered myself i sort of saw some of the things they put out there publicly i presume that's available to anybody you just need to be interested in computing at schools is there a lot on the raspberry pi or is it general general information it's a lot of general resources i think for the raspberry pi specifically the raspberry pi website is the best place to go uh, ben nuttall who creates the website is very efficient and organized and likes to have lots of information on there Please don't tell him I called him efficient and organised. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never live that down. He won't listen to this. I'll never live it down. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. So if people want to learn more about coding evenings and how to get involved with this, where's the best place for them to go? I've created a website called codingevening.org where I've put all the information about what I think coding evening is, how you can help host one how you can run one it's got sample wording um, and details other events that you can go to including the Twickenham and Peterborough coding evenings okay great well we'll definitely put some links to that in our show notes but um, thanks for giving us your time and thanks for coming on the show thank you for inviting me yeah that was really good talking to uh, Kat Lemon I met her at the the Raspberry Jam uh, a while back and uh, she's really 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 excited about getting kids into into coding and i mean her big focus as you know now is is assisting the teachers getting the teachers on board getting them to understand what's involved and making it easy and enjoyable for them to do it yeah she's just full of enthusiasm when i met her she she just seemed like just such a great person to do this she's such a people person she just got on with everyone really well and um yeah i, I could see her spreading this and i can see it growing way beyond what it is at the moment i could see it going worldwide potentially yeah, I'm really amped up to get this, uh, get her in touch with some of the teachers at my Raspberry Pi meetup because I think this is something they've been looking for, and I think they could take this to a good level around this area and get more teachers and kids interested. So, props to her and the Code Evenings because that's very big time, huge for throwing out in the universe. That's I just love it. Yeah, and so with that, then we're coming to the end of another Pi podcast. Thanks to everyone that left comments on the website and emailed us. Your feedback really is appreciated. Uh, if you want to get in contact, you can email show at thepiepodcast.com or find us on Twitter, Facebook, Stitcher, iTunes, and even YouTube, or leave a comment on the website. Thanks for joining me, Albert and Isaac, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks for another interview and Raspberry Pi news and discussion. Bye, everyone. Take care. See you later. <laughs>